are you? Difficult question, isn't it? Who are you before the world told you who you should be? Let me put that in a different way. Who were you before you linked your phone number to your Aadhaar card? So the Aadhaar card is an identification card for every citizen of India and it gives each one of them a unique 12 digit code like this one. That makes you into a 12 digit number. Have you seen your Aadhaar card photo? Do you remember what it looks like? Most of us are still trying to forget. You thought this was going to be a good photo. You were ready for this one with your trademark look and flash. Weeks later, you get your card, you open the envelope, and you can't stand looking at it. It's horrible. Why is that? Well, of the many possible reasons, perhaps the most common one is that you're not smiling in the photo. And wh what happened there? Because it's part of the protocol of having the card made. You're not supposed to smile. And that can make you feel uncomfortable. Well, that's kind of what it's like wearing an identity you are not comfortable in. Now, we spend a lot of time trying to have an impact on the world. We want to have an impact on the world. But do we really think about how the world around us shapes us into who we are? and shapes our identity. And why is it so important to have a well-defined identity anyway? Well, Mrs. Brawny Ware, a palliative care nurse, that's someone who takes care of people in their last remaining days of life. Uh, now, while uh, working with her patients, uh, her patients would tell her about their lives and what the regrets were in their lives. And she put together a book called The Top 5 Regrets of Dying of their dying. And she mentions in this book that the number one most common regret was, and I quote, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. What does this mean? Well, we struggle a lot to find the right balance between satisfying our true self, what we want to become, and satisfying what others want us to become. Isn't this something we can work on? Well, this is something we can work on. And uh, let's, what is the true self anyway? Let's look at the first ingredient. And it isn't the 12 digit number of the Aadhaar code, it's actually four letters. A, G, C, T. Put together in a specific sequence into your DNA which exists inside every single cell of your body. But this sequence is so long that if you decided to print it out in the form of a book, this book would have 130 volumes, which a few scientists in the UK were kind enough to show us. That's what it looks like. And this DNA, it makes your biological identity. Now, your biological identity is what you see when you stand in front of a mirror. It's the texture of your hair, the color of your skin, and your eyes, and unfortunately, the size of your nose. All of this is written information in your DNA. But we rarely start rambling our DNA sequence when someone says, tell me about yourself. What makes us who we are is the people we are born into, and the circumstances and experiences that shape us. And for us as Indians, one of these is Sanskar. It's a Sanskrit word for cultured and it refers to the upbringing of a child in an Indian home. But you can also consider it as the values that a family teaches its children in a home in any part of the world, really. And it's really important. It paints and colors us inside and out, just like at the end of the day on Holi. It teaches us our cultural values, how we relate to our history, what our religious beliefs are, and what we call the difference between right and wrong. Now, as amazing and necessary as it is, it also ends up creating a lot of conflict in our minds and especially the minds of young adults. 
the constant push and pull of the identity that is demanded by us from our families and from our culture and the identity we want to cultivate for ourselves. Now, what can we do about this? Can we make it better? There is a solution and it isn't a self-help book. It's science. Science has taught us a lot about our minds and our biology. But what can we learn from science in dealing with these conflicts? Well, let's look at some of the common things we inadvertently end up learning while growing up and what science can tell us about them. Number one, try not to question the way things are too much. We hear this way too often. Now, it makes sense initially. Asking the wrong question at the wrong time can be rude, disrespectful, or even rebellious. So we tend not to ask too many questions. We teach our children, when they go to school, we teach them to become critical thinkers, to think for themselves. But when they come back home, we deny them the right to do so. We tell them that this area is unquestionable. What does science say? Science says, question everything. That questioning is important, not only, not only necessary, but it's essential and it's honorable. Next point is what I call trial and terror. Now, we are terribly cautious of taking leaps, naturally. When we, when we do take leaps and we do succeed, we tend to stop right there because we're afraid of losing what we have. And on the other hand, if we try something new but fail, we tend to go back to something that is more comfortable and accepting of us, somewhere where we, where we don't have to try so hard and face the fear of failure. What does science say? Well, the obvious answer is trial and error. Error, mistakes, they're not something to shy away from. And as Bob Ross said, there are no mistakes, only happy accidents. The next point is conformity. Now, this simply means that we adjust our behavior and thinking according to the behavior and thinking of the group we belong to. And this is useful to us. It helps us fit in with our group. It helps us bond with each other better. But its influence on us was perhaps best explained by a psychologist named Solomon Ash in a really cool experiment he did. Now, uh, what he did was he sat down five people and he told them that they were going to be tested on their visual perception. And he showed them something that looked like this. On the left side of the screen, we have a standard line of a certain length. And on the right side of the screen, we have three lines of different lengths. And he simply asked the participants to name the line which is the same length as the standard line. Simple enough, right? But there was a catch. Four out of five of those participants, they were in on the experiment. They were actors. And they were told to give the right answers initially, but then start giving the wrong answers later on. And what he found was remarkable. On average, one third of the participants answered incorrectly with the group. And 75% of them answered incorrectly at least once. That means 75% of people denied the obvious truth right in front of them just to answer with the group so that they can fit in better with that group, so that they don't have to stand out. That says a lot about us and how groups affect us. The next point is the us versus them dynamic. Now we grow up as part of one large diverse culture and we develop a, a strong commitment to it. But at the same time, we end up developing a dislike to everyone who isn't a part of this culture. Now how science can help us here is that we understand that this is a phenomenon called group polarization. And that by being aware of it, we can learn to be careful of it and prevent it from starting in the first place. Now, keeping all of these factors in mind, it can lead us to a place of balance where we can learn to respect our culture and our sanskar, and at the same time resolve the conflicts it creates. Now, remember that even though we're the second largest population in the world, we do just make up 17% of its population. Now, 
what if you never had to struggle with your identity? What if it was never that difficult for you? Now, this is called identity foreclosure. And let me give you a very simple example to understand this. Say that you needed to buy a pair of pants. You don't have a good pair of pants. And you walk into the next room and you see your father's trousers hanging elegantly in the wardrobe. And you say to yourself, hey, that's a good pair of pants. My father wears them all the time. He likes them a lot. Why don't I just wear his? If you did this with your identity, that is foreclosure. It's when you picked up the first example you saw without really trying different options and you committed to it really well. Now, you will have no problems in life if you go ahead with this method, but unless something or someone comes along and challenges your worldview, say that the fashion changes, all of a sudden skirts are in, pants are no longer the thing. You are shocked. You can't believe what's happened. You've worn pants your whole life. Your father wore pants his whole life. How, how come skirts are the thing now? It's hard to comprehend because you never took the time out to figure out the other options. And say that you didn't choose your father's pants. Say you said, I'm not going to do this. And you decided to go to the store and try out different options. So you grabbed a lot of pair of pants. You picked them up. You went to the trial room. But you never came back because you were lost in your choices. This is identity moratorium. Now, we do this by delaying the option of choosing an identity for us, one thing we can commit to, by taking shelter in an institution. And this happens to be college most often for us. What we do is we go into identity moratorium and we delay the decision of taking an identity and uh, we try out whole different options. But we don't have to commit to one. We don't have to settle for one. Now, even though these two stages, identity, foreclosure, and moratorium, they are stages in the development of your identity. But the final step is identity achievement. That is when you've tried out different options. You've explored them really well and then pick one that best fits you and then you can commit to it and trust me after you do this after you try out all your possible options you will never be frustrated with the choices you have made or the choices others have made in their life so this is how science can help us in resolving these conflicts in life now the moment we realize we're not the same as our parents or our families we tend to go into hiding, where we make sure that they never find out what we really are. They never find out who we really are. Or we rebel, as if it's the last thing we have left to do. Both of these options are not as healthy as you think they are. And perhaps science can show you the way. And remember, always keep asking yourself, am I who I am because of my circumstances or regardless of them? Thank you.